All right, now we've made it to nitrogen. Now this is the element that most people become first associated with in gardening when they start thinking about amendments or what minerals or elements or nutrients go in the soil. This is the, the, the first in the NPK, it is the N, it is nitrogen. Nitrogen is found throughout the universe and it's in all organic compounds in the soil. It's 78% of the atmosphere. So it's in the interstitial spaces of the soil, the air pockets of the soil. It's in every breath we take. It's the majority of our atmosphere. So it's always there. It's always readily available and that's good because it's the engine of life. It's this, it's the centerpiece of protein, peptides and amino acids. While it's a colorless gas, when it's in uh, a form in the air, it's throughout everything performing vital processes. And so nitrogen is similar to carbon, sulfur and phosphorus in that it can give and take eight electrons and it allows them to have the greatest effect on pH and EH soil redox potential. And so 80% of the ions absorbed by plant roots in the vegetative state while it's growing are nitrogen. And then it drops down to 10 to 20% during reproductive. So, in, so that implies it could be 80 to 90%. So the majority of the time, the, the importance of nitrogen is at the growth stage. And it's so important that if we don't, it'll stymie flowering, fruiting, and it'll screw everything up. So we really have to limit nitrogen. And also it's different forms of nitrogen, but always in a mix. So, so if we look at this chart here, we notice that you know bacterial abundant, uh, alkaline, that's nitrate. And then below that fungal abundant, acidic, that's ammonium. But look, annuals prefer dominant nitrate with a little bit of ammonium and perennials prefer dominant ammonium with a little bit of nitrate. So, th and, and this is true of plants, but in general, it's nitrates that lead in vegetative and then fruiting is ammonium and not so much. And in a soil distribution, that on average is closer to pH 6.57, it's going to have over above seven and it's gonna have below 6.5. And that's gonna give a perennial plant the ability to really you know pick and choose. But the same thing can be said of planting an annual plant. Maybe you have it more on the seven side or maybe you're doing non-mycorrhizal and then you're like 7.5. And even then that's an average and there will be acidic zones within that natural soil that will allow that healthy plant in that natural soil to access both nitrate and ammonium. So in that pH swing that I keep talking about micrometer to micrometer, four to nine, we see that there's ample amounts of nitrate and ammonium along these gradients when it's present, when there's biology that's able to fix this. And there's free living microbes that fix nitrogen. There's also rhizobia, which you know uh, is gonna form a nodule and there's different kinds of nodules, but they'll form a nodule on, on, on a root and, and hide from oxygen and do it there. So it's really, and, and make a really acidic environment really reduced. And so it really depends on where you are and the kind of plant you're working with. But it, 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 this holds true that plants need this mix. Nitrogen historically has been something that we've applied with manures. And so that's why it's so common to arrive at it first. It is one of the oldest ways that we've fertilized soils and, and, and plants. And what happened was right before World War II, the Haber-Bosch process was created and ammonia, synthetic 
the the synthetic fixation of nitrogen into ammonia NH3 you know they could use petrochemicals to do this and suddenly they realized they could make bombs they could make fertilizer they could make all this all these nitrogen rich products synthetically purified and it would make really green big plants it would make lots of bombs and this was actually you know a secret of hitler's sustaining power and also his deadliest um, uh, uh, weapons and crimes so it, the it's really a sad story when you when you get into it but synthetic nitrogen was created and then used for all this harm in World War II. And then it was used to create a boom in food in in the Green Revolution starting in America. But it too led to great amounts of death because what happened was the synthetic nitrogen went into the soil, desiccated the soil, destroyed the soil structure and all the biology and caused eutrophication on the rivers as the soils eroded away and then dead zones at the deltas and the coastlines. And that food now is growing in dead soil. So the food is now increasingly dead and toxic. And we're, we just see a situation that we're continuously having harm come out from it. And so this whole Haberbosch process has been nothing but harm, but they they started off with good intentions. You know, one of the the creators of the Haberbosch process was Jewish, and he had to flee Germany, and then they used his formula to do all this and create the gas in the concentration camps. And so... And, and and so that painful irony, awful, bitter irony, and then ha- to, to have it go out and try to, you know, we thought it was going to be this green revolution and then it caused even more harm. Bitter, bitter irony, right? So it's important to understand the context of all that. So we can talk about it. We can talk about how bad it is, but also with, you know, sensitivity for how bad bad all of that turned out for all of us but man it's like a cursed technology almost um not to get superstitious now but but synthetic nitrogen has this long this long legacy of harm and so we really need to rely upon natural forms of nitrogen because they're coming to us in organic compounds they're coming to us in in forms that the plants and the microbes can work with or have been working with and it works really well it works better than the synthetic and so leading on that foot that we can heal this process we've got better solutions we know the microbes and 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 we might not necessarily need the manures we not might right right we could we could be inoculating things and have microbes do the work inside and outside There are endophytic nitrogen fixers. Yep, they exist. And you may have heard about them. I mean, if you look at the cover, top right corner of the cover of regenerative soil, you see this aerial root phenomenon where the exudation of the roots, this mucilage that is being released at the roots has nitrogen fixing microbes inside it. And they are fixing nitrogen right there, right then. And that that tip of that plant is absorbing those nutrients. So it's generating those sugars. It's generating, you, and you can see it. It's all happening right there. It's absolutely incredible. We need to return to organic nitrogen sources and biologically generated nitrogen sources for our plants because honestly as we get into this you'll see that dr lane ingham's initial assertion that plants you know get the best nutrition from microbes is absolutely right 
but it's a whole plethora of microbes. Uh, not just the original soil food web group and that mechanism. There's rhizophagy. There, there is of course, you know, the way minerals come into the cation exchange, you know, and 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 the proton exchange. That's happening too. But all these things are happening at the same time. Mycorrhizae are bringing things in. And so the mycology world, the biology world, the chemistry world, the 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 new frontiers of the the biology and mycology worlds, you know, rise of age, the, all these things are coming together to give us a completely new picture of the diversity by which these plants feed. You know, as, as I interviewed Dr. Lane Ingham, you know, recently, and she she remarked upon how you know Mother Mother Nature is constantly teaching us, constantly showing us new ways that plants get nutrition, new ways of understanding things. So these actually, speaking of Elaine, these are diagrams that I originally started and I've updated a bit, but I originally started on with Dr. Elaine Ingham when she was teaching me one-on-one, -on -one, I think it's six years ago now that we started um, working on the Permaculture Student 2 soil sections together. Well, we did a lot of work together. That was my original soil mentor. And from there, I started studying with other scientists and started getting into all the details um, from other perspectives and putting it uh, together. And so um, these are updated and um, subtly so, but, but critically so. So th these are really good guides for the way our world works, but they're not complete. pH, I mean, people have been using pH and still using pH as if it's uh, this, this gold standard. But as you know, it's micrometer to micrometer that things are changing wildly and we're only getting this average. But then you should also know that the whole redox thing uh, is the other leg of pH in an XY diagram. So we're going to get into this. That's the, the redox chart, the, the pole base charts. We're going to get into all that. The, the introduction's coming. But I just want you to know that this, some of you are going to look at this chart, the alkaline to acidic, the disturbed area to the forest, the beach to the forest, and it's not going to fit your bioregion. And that's because there's an X here. <laughs> so opposite, this is another group, smaller group, but another group going opposite. So we are going to look at all that. We're going to look at the, the, the exceptions. We're going to dive into all that. But this is the, the, this is the main, like this is cold temperate. This is, this is the, the, you know, North America, Europe. Um, this is most climates. But there are exceptional climates in like Madagascar, parts of Africa, parts of uh, the South Pacific, islands um, uh, near extreme geological phenomenon. There, there, there are there are extreme soils, and so if you don't see yourself here, you might be there, and we'll get there. So just <laughs> just stick with us because all of this really matters. All right, so. Like I talked about organic nitrogen, that's the organic compound with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Yes. Nitrogen's number one in, in the soil nutrients after those because it's included with those in the organic compound. So it completes the, the picture and, and it has this great effect on everything around it. It's, it, it. It has the most effect on all the other ions. So these could be plants, animals, fungi, anything made of organic matter will have organic nitrogen in it. And so this is why soil microbes are so important because they're going to release that nitrogen in a form that plants can access. Because when it's bound as organic nitrogen in an organic compound, it's not ready for plants to, to, to just consume. You know, otherwise then we would just be like throwing manure, just fresh manure on our plants all the time and everything would be gravy, but that's not good. <laughs> and so we, we got to understand that we need to process the organic nitrogen with microbiology, with saprophytes, 
and and breaking it down so that it's in a form that we possibly could deliver like that in a spray or in a soil soak that would be beneficial. And we'll talk more about that. Ammonium. So ammonium, NH4 plus. So you're like, that's the cation. That's, you know, acidic. This lower soil pH and reduces and acidifies the soil. You know, it's bringing in more electrons. It is, it, it is bringing in more H. So it's, it's, it's lowering the pH. And, and this, this is, this can really help. But at the same time, if you go too far, you could acidify the soil and have heavy metals released, right? So we want to make sure because ammonium not only acidifies the soil, it acidifies the plant and then the plant releases protons in response. So it's that like-like thing and then it can get out of control. But that's why soil organic matter is so critical to have high in your soil. So if you're adding nitrogen, it can really buffer against those changes in the in the EH, in the pH EH. And you can also have the microbiology control, take up and body that nitrogen so that it gets released at the timing and preference of the plant. Next form is nitrate. Again, that is what we talked about is NO3 negative. There's an O in there, not an H, so it's oxidized. So it's, and it's negative. So you're on the alkaline side and oxidized side already. Just by looking at the form of these things, you can just tell, you can just know. And I mean, saying nitrate kind of can make it seem ambiguous, but when you see NO3 negative, you're like, ah, okay, I know who you are. Hanging out on the anion side right? The plant needs to be releasing hydroxide to reach you. So that's oxidizing, that's alkalinizing, it's making the plant more alkaline, making the soils more alkaline, and, you know, could be reinforcing a bad situation. And in fact, something to think about is that plants require four times as much water to process nitrates. So if you are putting nitrates onto your soil, like a, a, a nitrogen rich compound, like let's say it's organic nitrogen, but your soils are oxidized and alkaline, they will transform within hours that nitrogen source, even if it's ammonium, into nitrate. So then your plants are dealing with nitrate and nitrates, remember nitrates are bad. You've probably heard of spinach and lettuce and kale all having too high nitrates. They're having nitrates come in with the wastewater from up upstream CAFOs and people are really worried. People don't want nitrates, they're bad for you. They can hurt your kidneys, all sorts of things. And so nitrates are, 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 are something that we don't want in excess because the reality is if we just look a little closer, we need nitrates for vegetative growth. So it's this overabundance, this inability to properly cycle the nitrates. It's protein synthesis is what's going on. That they're failing to finish, there's too many nitrates, or they've taken up too much energy trying to, to process the nitrates because it takes 16% more energy than, than normal to take in nitrates and process them and make them into to a form the plant can work with. So it's taking four times as much water. It's taking 16% of its energy. It's sapping it of energy. So man, the plant's stressed already. And then a stressed plant releases more hydroxide, taking on more nitrate in this runaway train effect. So we, we are seeing plants dis destroy the soil around them when they're stressed, destroy themselves when they are stressed and make bad food for the people. So if you're growing plants in bad soil, you're not gonna have good plants unless there's microbiology there that allows it to overcome that. And then those plants are the plants to save seeds from because they will endophytically have the biology that allows them to perform at that level. So just observation, right? We gotta, we gotta observe. So nitrates are important to, up to a point, like we, we're getting at, and, and they inhibit 
if there's too much nitrate, they inhibit a lot of processes from respiration to amino acid formation to water efficiency use, like up to 50% of the water usage is affected. So it's really, really important to understand that nitrogen is problematic. This is why we have these plants that are just nitrates and water because they require so much water and then nitrates you know, are vegetative growth. So there's tons of nitrates, so they're growing really big, really fast. And meanwhile, that plant is nothing but water and nitrates and it's extra thin cell walls and it's full of nitrates. So they're easily penetrated walls and nitrates feed pests from pathogenic fungi to sucking bugs like grasshoppers, hornworms, aphids. All those things are feeding on nitrates and other oxidized compounds. So plants that are stressed are calling those things in from up to you know, kilometers away like an antenna these these nitrates stand out in the infrared. They're, they're, they're just very, very visible, very stark, and they send out a signal, um, these plants do, uh, according to research from Philip Callahan. And so these plants that are calling out their stress, they're calling down these pests to, to take them out of the ecosystem because they're doing harm to the ecosystem. So it's incredibly important for us to understand that if we have alkaline oxidized soils that we need to fix our soils first before we're like going to be like adding fertilizer to help plants and at the same time if we've already done that we just need to flip the pheh so we'll talk more about that as we go but it's it's going to be easy you're going to be like really let's do this because <laughs> because we all can do this and, and one final thing, almost everything is like this, that we need enough to survive and thrive, but too much kills us. We are like Goldilocks. We need it just right. Our planet Earth needs to be in the just right zone. pH of plants, the just right zone. The, the nitrogen in the just right zone. And actually I would say the just right swing, right? Because when we look at the nitrogen cycle, according to EH, we see that it's that swing of EH to oxidize to reduce that gives us the diversity, just like in pH, it's that swing. So it's differentials, it's microbiology, it's a diversity of aerobic and facultative, and maybe even anaerobic, because natural soils do have anaerobic pockets here and there. So it's really important and critical that we see it from that perspective. I mean, even lead, arsenic, uranium, these things are natural. They are not inherently evil. It is the fact that they are naturally found only in small amounts and we've concentrated them and turned them into pollutants that we've created the situation that we're in. But when things are properly taken into carbon chains in inert form in these matrices that holds them in appropriate ratios, we don't have problems. And in fact, there's, there's, there, there is evidence that they might not necessarily help the plants, but help other parts of the systems that are in the soil in action. And, and there's no such thing as, you know, an element that is evil. So we have to realize that there's a greater context at work here and we just need to not demonize things and instead find that Goldilocks, find that environmental balance point that allows us to reincorporate, to remediate and regenerate our world. All right, let's go to the next one. Regenerative soil is the breakthrough that farmers and gardeners all over the world are using to unlock the full potential of their plants and soils. Universities are doubling their yields. Farmers are increasing their water holding capacity by thousands of gallons of water per acre per year. Gardeners are seeing pest pressure disappear and evaporate. The most challenging aspects of growing food are being addressed by focusing on the linchpin to all life, the soil. If we can get our soil right, 
we can grow amazing food, raise amazing animals, and overcome all of these challenges. We skip the pests, the diseases, the viruses, and soil damage. We instead focus on making things better and better. So our food, yields, and nutrition continue to improve exponentially with every single season. Learn to understand soil from the micro to the macro, down to the individual microbes, ions, and enzymes, and how they directly relate to hands-on action and pragmatic strategies for our farms, fields, and gardens. We can grow food faster with higher yields and nutritional density, but it all comes down and comes back to your soil. Is it resilient? Is it regenerative? Join us and change the way you see the world, food, soils, and everything and how it relates. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And click that link. Join us this season. Don't miss out.